All right, what's up community groups? Pastor Brent, Pastor Josh here. Concluding our season, we get to talk about one of the big ones, these big questions we've been discussing all week, all season. And uh, thank you for being with us the first season of 2022. We're going to kick back off in August. Uh, if you're interested in hosting a group and you've never hosted one before, maybe you've been taking a break and you want to host again, man, we love getting people together, talking about the Word of God. And this has been a fun season, just discussing some of these questions and deeper topics. Uh, everyone's done a great job last week. Adam and Jess took on the topic of uh, predestination. That was some deep stuff, and they did a great job. And this week, we get to talk about morality. Morality. And the question is, is morality something that we're born with or something that we're taught by culture? And so that's why Pastor Josh is here. He has all the answers. And so we're expecting so much wisdom from him. I think uh, what we get, what we're going to have to start and jump off from is the fact that well, you need to understand something uh, from a uh, perspective of Scripture and God being in control of everything. There is no morality without God. Like if you, if you talk to an atheist, there are people I've had conversations with, they don't believe in God, and they would say, I don't believe in morality. But the, the problem with that statement is, if I lie to this person, they're going to be mad that I lied to them. If I steal from them, they're going to have a problem with that. Because we all have morality in us. Something, a code written on our heart to say there is an ultimate good, which is God, and an ultimate evil, which is not the devil. The ultimate evil is the absence of God. And so when we take God out of an equation, um, basically that's evil. And so we all have this law written on our heart. Whether you believe in God or not, you already believe in morality because you get mad when someone crosses you and does something wrong. And so the question is, are we born with this idea of morality in our heart, or is it something culture has taught us over time based maybe our upbringing? And the answer is yes. That doesn't really sound like an answer, Pastor Josh, but it is. The answer is yes, you're born with morality. You're born with God's uh, a code written on your heart, and you're also uh, born in a culture that teaches you certain cultural norms and morality, things that differ, and we're going to get into that a little bit based on your cultural upbringing and where you're living, all these different things. Uh, basically, morality, first of all, is something that you are born with. You're born with a code written on your heart. That's why it is not okay anywhere in the world to murder. And nowhere in the world is it okay to uh, rape or to lie or steal. Everywhere in the world, this would be looked down on by people because it's uh, violating some code in our heart that says, this is how I am supposed to be treated. I'm not, I'm not supposed to be lied to. I'm not supposed to be stolen from because we have a code written in our heart that says, this is not good. These are bad things. There's a morality that we uh, are born with that's innate morality, we call it. I mean, just basically means you're born with it. And the other type of morality is cultural morality, which differs based on where you are. Yeah. And I think before we can jump in, and there's, there's a, uh, a segue that jumps in from this, this inbred morality that God has inside of us, that He makes us. Why? Because, well, if we go off of Scripture, and even if you want to uh, just jump there, the easiest is we're made in the image and likeness of God. And so inside of us, the makeup of who God is is already there inside of us. And so we're already born with it. But to really understand, you have to go all the way back to the beginning to, to grab a hold of where this cultural aspect is, is put into place. And honestly, where we get the authority or we take the authority to give the judgment of, and it goes all the way back to the garden. You know, we, we know, we know the story. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but we know that, that uh, even off of uh, two Sundays ago when, and, and Brent uh, was preaching about Adam and, and coming out of the dirt. And, and so we understand that God created Adam and Eve. They put him in a garden. They had a tree of life and they had the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God gave one instruction, basically, that you can have anything, this, this everything, everything is permissive to you except this one tree, except this one idea of, of the knowledge of good and evil. And we know if we pick up in Genesis 3 that the story goes that for God, uh, Satan begins to tell Eve, for God knows that when you eat of this, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of it of the fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and they also ate. We understand that this point something changed 
in mankind. We asked sin entered by disobedience, but there was already a morality beforehand because we can all say that, oh, well, Adam and Eve were perfect. They were without blame before. Well, there was something that they had still a decision to make. It wasn't that they ate the fruit and all of a sudden now they were sin. They were able to enter into disobedience before they even took one bite of the fruit. So there was already a code that was written on them that they knew this was not right because God had said it to them. But we, the tree represented for Adam the choice between submitting to God or pursuing moral autonomy. See, fearing the Lord, the beginning of wisdom, or judging for himself what good and evil are. That is what the serpent tempted Adam and Eve with. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. See, knowing good and evil does not refer to the possession of just information like one would know the capital of, you know, the country or a state or or something along those lines. But it is an active phrase and refers to a discernment between good and evil or more simply making judgments. So what ended up happening is Adam and Eve, out of order, decided to become the judge of good and evil. Thus enters in the cultural aspect of why we get um, certain um, influences of what we consider good and evil. And we're going to talk about those a little bit and just uh, more in depth. But I wanted to say at this point is what entered in mankind's decision. And what does it say? Sin was not just of eating of a fruit and having knowledge of good and evil. The sin was now you become the arbiter of sin. You become the one who judges it. You judge good and evil. You make the call. And now God is not given the authority over your life to make that call anymore, where we supersede what has already been birthed inside of us. That is the sin. And so when Brent said at the beginning, well, which is it? What is it? It's both because of what happened in the garden. That's good. So basically what we look at to see is something sinful, is something morally right or morally wrong. Our basis for all of us has to start with the Word of God. If the Word of God says it's wrong, it's wrong. Like, it's not morally right because we believe that uh, God inspired the entire Word of God. So a lot of things are, are easily addressed in Scripture. Like, if I say, is adultery okay, Pastor Josh? Of course not. Nope, Uh, because the Bible specifically says no. But then there are also other things that the Bible gives us uh, a lens to view a current sin through that wasn't available back in that day. Like if I said, is pornography immoral? Because pornography is not in the scripture, Josh. It doesn't actually say pornography. So, But it does say to flee sexual immorality. And so any sexual um, immorality outside of your marriage covenant is, is sinful. And so you have to look at it through this lens. And then you come to pl- other points in morality where you say, well, I grew up and that wasn't okay in my church. And so what we've gotten really good at, though, is as Christians is, is we judge other people's sin based on my faith or how I was raised. I was raised in a house where, where uh, you don't smoke cigarettes. That's sinful. But if we're being honest, the Bible doesn't tell us it's sinful to smoke cigarettes specifically. Uh, I heard an old country preacher say one time... Uh, Cigarettes won't send you to hell, but they'll make you smell like you've been there. But they basically, we, we, we do this, and, and we're going to get more into this. I'm not saying smoke cigarettes is not going to send you to hell. That would be stupid because you want to be addicted to anything um, will, willfully. But what we have to understand is some things that we grew up with in our culture as immoral, other cultures may not see them in the same way. And the scripture doesn't specifically say they're immoral. Like, for instance, smoking cigars. In my house, in my church, when I was growing up, um, smoking cigars would have been unheard of. It was sinful. Um, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't chew, and I don't hang with those that do, or something like that. That's, and so, we, uh, but you, in Europe, and even in the eastern United States, there's what we would call more liberal Christians who have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but they have no conviction about something like that. And so, there has to be... Um, a lens that we have to view these things through. And so I want to look at that a little bit. Do you want to go into your stuff, 
Yeah. So really understanding this, I'm going to, I'm going to really talk at a high level here and I'm going to give practical examples. Um, there are so many resources out there to dive into it if you really are interested in it. But one way to really understand and ask myself, where did I really understand what I think is right and wrong? Where does that culturally come into place with me? Um, really all bears down to one thing. And that's really the way that you view the world, your worldview. Um, and, and so I'm going to just quickly run through six metaphors that kind of uh, uh, give us a practical picture of, of similar worldviews that we can actually view morality through and that you could understand why when somebody's viewing it through one of these lens, why they would view something as bad or good and then another lens that's completely different. So the first one we're, we're, most of us could be familiar with um, that if you grew up in church and you understand a little bit of the word, you understand that life is a gift. And, and, and this metaphor, life is a gift, is kind of the meaning of life is established at creation. Uh, it's grounded in wisdom and literature from our faith-based belief. It's based from our Christian belief. It, 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 it is we live, our morals are a gift from God. So no matter the ups and downs, the transitions, everything that we go through, it is a gift. And so we view it through that. Um, in this metaphor, it's essential to be in line with the creator of the universe and it, it's difficult, and no matter how difficult it is, the purpose of life is to be in line or unified with our Creator. And some of this may sound familiar. So through our biblical lens, and through, and, and you may have heard similar phrases like this that you know the um, the Judeo-Christian worldview of America is dwindling, or some long like what they're saying is is this lens that people are viewing morality through is shifting. And, and there is shift that is happening, and there is a set of beliefs that come with the quote-unquote Judeo-Christian worldview, um, or something similar to like life is a gift. But in contrast, a little bit, where life becomes a marketplace. Here's another lens that you can view life as, where life is a marketplace. And in this metaphor, everything is for sale. Your life, everything that you do is based on competition. It's based on value. It's based on uh, how much work and input that, that exactifies what you get out of it. Maybe some of that sounds familiar for you. What you put into life is what you get out of life, right? You've heard some of these phrases before. The marketplace is a successful um, expression of individuals, companies, and cultures pursuing their self-determined product. We in America, this probably sounds familiar, right? Where, where you can come and build your own dream, right? This is a place where, where what you put, your input equals output, and we want to live on a level playing field. And, and this also... Uh, when taken into an extreme, makes self-interest actually priority over others. Why? Because to win at life with this metaphor morally is you do everything you can to make it to the top, to sell the most, to get the most money, to get this, to, to be the best. Competition drives life. And so you look at things through this. So, for example... In this lens, and I'll give it quickly because I don't want to take up too much time, is let's say you're uh, running a company, right? And you know that this person is not doing very much work for your company, maybe losing money for your company. Their family's going through a hardship, but it's better for your company to let this person go. And so in a lens like this, you would have no heartache letting this person go. But if you viewed uh, through a different lens, it may actually make it hard for you to let this person go because you know more personal information about them. And so all of a sudden you are met with a different version where one person is justified because the company's suffering, another person is justified because the individual is suffering. Life is a marketplace. The next one is life is a body. In this metaphor, we are all members of a single complex but essentially well-ordered living system. We're all brothers and sisters. Every member is important to every other member and what affects one affects everyone. In this metaphor, specializes in is necessary specializations are necessary so there's the toe there's an eye liver lung etc and each are necessary for the whole the living system seeks balance order balance and full functioning of this highly complex system is what is most valuable so decisions and morality must favor the health of the whole body and not just one member or group of members 
And so in this metaphor, we ask, ask the hard question of how to keep balance and order of the needs, right? So in this kind of, of way, um, where one person may suffer, but at the expense that the, everybody else thrives, this would be moral. So one suffers, everybody thrives, is because the group or the collective actually is. But it also refers to it in, 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 when you look at sports and you think of that way, where when one of our members are hurting, we're all hurting, or you, you hear those phrases as well. Well, it's when you're viewing life through this lens, where we're a body, where we're, we're one of of just different you know, people that work. And you can see this littered in all different aspects. And when I say not every single person has just one view of these, we blend some of these together that actually creates our culture. And where those are from starts with your family. And I'll, I'm not gonna get there just yet, but in this lens of, of a body is very much um, in areas where you, could, you would see socialism rise up in this kind of lens. You would see um, where, where it's the collective, where everybody should be on, on this even playing field because it's the whole body that flows. We may not be equal in the way that we look, or we may not be equal, but what we give to this should be equal, and what we receive should be equal. Everybody is at the expense of everybody else and on the even playing field. The next one is life is ups and downs, and that's all what it is about ups and downs. And essentially, this uh, lens or this worldview um, seen as life is a battle, and it's a battle between those that have and those that have not. It's the ups and downs. And then mostly this lens is viewed from the point of view of those that are downs or the oppressed. In this metaphor, we're always oppressed. Since the beginning of time, the ups have always gotten more and worked more and wanted more, which they have taken from those that are down. Life is a battle over the oppressor, the ups to, the, uh, to put ups, um, the downs in their place. And society does not need tinkering. It needs fundamental change. Uh, fundamental or revolutionary change is possible and desired in this metaphor, and the change is most likely only possible through violence or some coercion of some sorts. If you're not with us, then you're against us, may be a common phrase that you've probably heard with this lens. As oppressed people, there is no hope but only frustration. Selfishly, we can become stuck and feel sorry for ourselves. This lens is, is a lens that we can grow up in, and maybe, maybe uh, you can play this to some of the culture things that we have going on, but in your own life, you can see yourself playing in this lens. Uh, nobody ever sees me. My boss hates me. I never get promoted. I'm always the one, I, nev- I always get overlooked through the lens of ups and downs, this is the language that comes out. So, for example, when somebody that you would consider as an oppressor or those that are up, something bad happens to them, that becomes justified and moral to you because of all the bad that's happened to you. See, in this lens, anything that happens to oppressors is okay, no matter how bad it is. In other lenses, just because of where it puts you. And anything that can raise you upper, puts you in an up place, is moral. So example would be the ends justify the means, right? So if the ends of this thing, it justifies the means of getting there. And you'll, you'll hear a lot of this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each of these. i got two more for you. Life is a journey. In this metaphor, how to travel is important, maybe more important than the destination. What does this mean? It means life is not about one individual goal of getting there. It's about the whole life in and of itself, right? So The world never repeats itself. Process is as important as product. Good ends are not achieved through evil means. See, this is the opposite of what I just talked about. The meaning of life is in the traveling itself and the hope that the destination brings. Meaning is revealed to those who pay attention to the journey, who notice the changes in the road and turn of the weather and the ups and downs along the way. Excellent decisions will increase the capacity of the traveler to experience in this journey. In this metaphor, going on a journey will take the traveler through many interesting locations, none of which will be the final destination. Yet having a final goal or destination is important, even if the path does not stick to a straight line. Life is what happens while you are making other plans. In this view, everything... um, Everything doesn't happen to you, it happens for you in your journey. So when bad things come your way, it's not to bring you down, it's actually just another piece of your journey that pushes you forward. And so in this, when, you, when you're looking at morality and you're trying to view moral things in this, there's a lot of things on this journey that you would look at your life and be like, man, I see that that situation that happened to me has got me where I am now. Man, I would never want to choose that again, but it's good. 
And we would say that where I'm at now is good. And the last one that I want to throw at you is life is art. And to think about this as kind of like improv, um, improvational jazz or something like that. In this metaphor, life is shaped by creative actions and everyone is an artist. The meaning of life is created by the actions and perceptions of the engaged person. Life is about creating meaning and not discovering someone else's idea of meaning. Good decisions are those which increase creative power um, aesthetic pleasure to the artist. In this metaphor, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Life is open to interpretation. And so with this last one, this is where everything is permissible as long as it creates beauty. Uh, there, is, there isn't really lines. Morality is more subjective to the individual artist. Mo, uh, what is right and wrong in this person is subjective to the beauty that they are or becoming and what they want to make of themselves or who they want to be. They begin to fashion in their own likeness of what it is. Their art is what they want to create in themselves. And so morality is very fluid in this worldview lens, in this lens of life. And so you can kind of see that, for example, in some of these lenses, they would contrast one another. And so when you begin to talk about moral views, you begin to butt heads because we have people that look through, and I only use six, six metaphors, and there is a lot more than this, but there's only, these six metaphors already butt against each other, right? So the marketplace metaphor is going to bump up against the ups and downs metaphor every single time every single time. And the artist is going to bump up against um, where life is a gift every single time. Because they, the, the artist is for self-interpretation where the gift is a God interpretation. And so they're going to bump up against where one would say this is good, the other would call good bad, and what you would consider bad, the other would call good. An example I told Brent earlier that we can see practically is here in America, we have a revolution of, 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 of females that have conquered a lot of, of, of things in this world. Feminism has risen up and was, it was a good thing in the essence of women voting and women's rights and uh, businesses and, and being equal to men and doing a lot of things that have been great for putting women um, up higher. And we would look at that as good. And we would say that, that women in the homes or women at work, whatever they choose, that is good. Or, or women should not be put down or put in their place. That they should be equal, have the same. All of that in our view is good. And, and, and it is good. But in a country not too far from us, on the other side of the world, that's not in their lens good. And so when we look at places like Syria, we see that women are wearing shrouds and that they are talked down to and they're not allowed to speak directly to men or look them in the eye. We would say that those women are oppressed. In our lens, they're oppressed. In their lens, that's good. Which is hard for us to understand. It's hard for us to understand why when a woman does something in the West... In the East, they get beat or they get, they get hit. We're like, that is horrible. They need to be set free. In our lens, we see a freedom that they can attain, but their lens is, is bad, that they're actually actively doing something wrong to bring shame upon them or themselves. And so you can see that two different lenses in two different places of the world, let alone even in our cities or families, can cause us to disagree on what morals look like for us. That was a lot, Brent. Great job, Josh. I think you forgot one. Life is a highway, right? <laughs> it's the view of the lens of people who want to ride it all night long. They look through that. So stupid. Uh, but I think it, these are so crucial because what do we do is we take things that aren't in Scripture but are according to our cultural morality, and we find division in the body of Christ based on cultural morality that's not even in the scripture. And so I want to dive into how we can confront that scripturally and why this is so important because uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 23 through 24 kind of addresses this and shows us how to uh, dig through some of this cultural morality stuff. It says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Then it says, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor, which is basically saying all things are lawful. Like if it's not in scripture saying it's unlawful, then it's lawful. We, we have freedom in Christ to do, you know, everything beyond these things that the scripture can, says are immoral. These cultural things, we have to be able to understand I'm not okay with that. Like the Holy Spirit may have told me like, Pastor Brent, get that TV out of your house. You shouldn't have a TV in your house. 
but I can't go to Josh's house and be like, why do you have a TV in here? That's sinful. No, it's not. the Holy Spirit didn't tell him that. In the same way we have all these different cultural differences, we have to look at, look at the situation and say, how can I love my neighbor better? How can I love this person who came from a different culture better? Um, if I go over to someone's house, in my house, we don't, take, we don't have to take off our shoes when we come in the house. But when I go to someone else's house, um, like where I go to my community group, not naming any names, Jess and Adam, but they take off shoes in their house. And uh, so for me, when I remember to take off my shoes, because I've, <laughs> I've, been, I've, been, I've had a problem with that uh, before, but it's, it's one of those rules. When I step into their house, I want to love them in a way where they don't feel disrespected. And I'm not making them stumble and be angry or cause offense towards me because, because of something I don't do in my house. And so in the same way, we have to uh, look out for our neighbor. This comes into play so much. If I'm doing something in my life that I have freedom to do, but it's causing my neighbor to doubt or to sin or to stumble, then I'm not thinking about my neighbor. I'm using my freedom as a way to cause someone else to stumble. So if somebody has recently given up caffeine uh, and I go over to their house and I have a giant coffee in one hand, you know, and a soda in the other, or an energy drink, I don't drink those, those are terrible, but I have like all these things, you know, that, um, that they, have these, they have all this caffeine they've given up, and so now I'm walking in with it in my hand, it's empty, don't worry, Josh, I'm not going to spill in the church. Uh, it's, it would be me not looking out for my brother or sister. I'm not putting their needs before me. And they might start to think, you know what? Let me have a sip of that. It's been a while, Brent. And now something that they felt like the Holy Spirit told them to give up, now I'm causing them to stumble and putting it right in front of their face and saying, there's nothing wrong with this. You should be able to do this. But then we need to go to um, another verse. Romans 14, 23 says, but whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats. They're referring to uh, some cultural stuff at that time because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So if Josh no longer has the faith to drink caffeine because the Holy Spirit has given him some conviction in his heart saying, I, God asked me to put that down and I told him I would. Now he doesn't have the faith to drink caffeine. I have the faith to drink caffeine because the Holy Spirit has not spoken that to me. It's not in scripture to not drink caffeine specifically. So I'm being led by the Spirit and I haven't heard that from the Spirit. So I have the freedom to do it. I go bring it right in front of Josh's face. Now he's drinking caffeine, not out of faith, which makes it sin for Josh to drink caffeine. And I want to see the two dynamics of Christian culture. So he had to pick it up. He couldn't handle it. Um, the two dynamics of Christian culture that we are seeing now is fun fundamentally what is splitting so much of the body because you have one side that will come to Brent, and we'll just keep using this example, where I will go to Brent and be like, God told me to give up caffeine. You need to give up caffeine. Caffeine is bad. And I begin to make the moral judgment for Brent. I become God in Brent's life. Brent will come over and be like, Josh, you can have so much freedom. Just drink caffeine. It's okay. Don't, you're so bound up. You're so like in bondage. Let, you know, who the sun sets free is free indeed. All things are permissible. And what he's doing is he's actually becoming God in my life, giving me permission of something that God already told me no to. We at the church have become this, the, on both ends, we bypass God in the church and we begin to dictate, just like every other part of society, what people should and shouldn't do. And we begin to live their journey for them. And we begin to tell them, this is the way to live your journey. And we actually leave little room for the Holy Spirit to grow that person to mature that person to where when they are mature, the Holy Spirit now is directing them. Little is the Holy Spirit that directs the body of Christ today. Man directs the body of Christ today more than the Holy Spirit. We are supposed to be Holy Spirit driven in every aspect of our life. Because of what God created inside of us, the Holy Spirit can unlock that part of our DNA, the God DNA inside of us, that we will know what right and wrong is because of who God is inside of us. Galatians 5.13 kind of sums this all up well about loving our, each other and putting each other first. It says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. 
only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Meaning just because I have the freedom to do this doesn't mean I now have to do it in front of Josh. I need to serve and love Josh and understand what he has the faith to do and uh, not making him stumble. Uh, one more, of our, or let me tell you first, I love this this uh, author, C.S. Lewis. He's a theologian. He wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You probably have seen that movie. But uh, he, he wrote this book called Mere Christianity. And one of my favorite chapters of his book addresses morality. And, he, and basically, C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, uh, morality is like a symphony. And there are no wrong keys on the piano, just keys played in the wrong order and in the wrong timing. And I like that view of life because we look at things like you could look at um, sexual immorality and say, that's not the wrong key. That's just played in the wrong timing because God created us man and woman, you know, to be, to be married and to live together and leave your father, mother, become one flesh, all that. So the timing of when you play that note is the issue, not the note itself. Uh, and so everything, when you look at life, it, if you view it from that way is saying, God teach me to play a symphony. Teach me to play your symphony for my life. When is it okay for me to hit this key, and when is it not okay for me to hit this key? Because in Romans 8, 14, it says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And so we're no longer led by the flesh. I'm not led by what Josh says is okay and not okay. I'm led by the Spirit of God. He'll never contradict the Word of God. So as I'm studying the Word of God and finding out what's definitely morally incorrect because the the Word of God addresses it, I'm also asking the Holy Spirit to give me conviction and to lead me um, because... He may, he may say things to me as I grow closer to him. Your sensitivity increases. Your conviction increases. He may say things to me like, Brent, I, I want you to uh, let go of television. Like we said, I want you to let go of drinking coffee. I want you to stop saying that word that nobody else has a problem with. But to you, I want you to stop saying that. I want you to stop going to that place. I want you to stop dating that person. I want you, and these things are specific as I'm being led by the spirit of God, the morality for me now, what I have faith to do is being dictated by where God is leading me, not where anybody else is leading me, not what I can get away with. This means being led by the spirit of God. The hardest thing for us in the church is to trust the Holy Spirit in somebody else. We can trust the Holy Spirit inside of us because we feel like we have control of that. What we don't have control is the Holy Spirit in some, somebody else. And so really when we doubt the Holy Spirit in someone else, even when we consider what they're saying is wrong, what we're saying is the Holy Spirit in them is not the same Holy Spirit in me. And we have to be very careful. I'm not saying that's true for every single circumstance because there are times when people are just anti-Christ, anti-Jesus, and the Holy Spirit will never be anti-Jesus, ever. But we have to recognize the Holy Spirit is always working and we have to allow people to grow in the Holy Spirit. So that's our teaching for tonight. We're going to give you some discussion questions and pray. Uh, Not questions. Well, one question and one just kind of thing I just want to give you for fun just to talk about if you have time and you're interested in that kind of thing. Uh, But the question that we have for tonight that I want you to discuss is what has influenced your morality? personally, culturally, how were you raised that influenced your morality? Maybe some, maybe you weren't raised in church and that has influenced your morality. Uh, maybe you were raised in a very strict church where they wouldn't, you know, allow, any, they wouldn't let you go to a movie theater, you know, whatever it is. I'd love to have you guys share those stories with one another and where you came to maybe find some common ground and uh, realize, you know what, just because I grew up that way doesn't mean that scripturally that's wrong and uh, give each other grace uh, as you looked into each other's cultures and where you're from and uh, discuss that. And uh, also, so I have a uh, moral ethical question for you to discuss. I just love this, um, this topic, this discussion, if you have time. So I'm going to give you two, two separate uh, possibilities, and I want you to make a moral decision on each of them and discuss what the right decision is. Uh, so you are standing on a bridge with another person, and you look down over the bridge, and here comes a train on train tracks that run under the bridge. Next to you is a, pull, a lever you can pull and switch the tracks on the other side of the bridge. If, the, if you do not pull this lever, the train is going to run over three people tied to the tracks. 
if you do pull the lever, the tracks, the train will change tracks and only run over one person tied on the other tracks. Do you pull that lever? Uh, it's easy. Most people in this case would say, yes, you pull the lever because you want to save the three people and uh, one person's going to die. That's too bad, but we're saving three lives, so it's worth it, right? <laughs> as long as it's not me on the tracks, it's fine. Uh, but then the other situation, similar situation, you're on a bridge with one other person. You look down, here comes a train under the bridge. Uh, two, you see in front of the train, I'm sorry, not two separate tracks. You see in front of the train, three people tied to, to the train tracks. The only way for you to save these three people tied to the train tracks don't try and make up some other possibility. There's only one way to save them. You have to push the person standing with you on the bridge onto the tracks. They die. The other three live. Do you push that person onto the tracks? So discuss that among one another. Most people, I'll tell you, the consensus is that they would pull the lever to kill the person, but they would not push the person, which is the exact same result, but something about physical touch and feeling like I'm responsible for my moral decision if I touch you. And so uh, it's interesting. Morals is such an awesome topic. I love discussing this and uh, growing and learning together. Thank you so much for joining us for community groups this season. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. And uh, we look forward to getting back into these in August. Do you want to pray for us? Jesus, we love you. We thank you that the Holy Spirit that you gave and sent is what is dwelling inside of each and every one of us. And so I just pray over every single group, every single person that here this and, and talks about this. Holy Spirit, just indwell them even right now in greater uh, uh, portions. Fill their life wherever they are at and begin to speak to them, drawing ever so closely to them, ever so closely through the unification of the Father and of the Son through the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you that you have written upon us your DNA. Allow that DNA to supersede anything else in our lives. In Jesus' name, I bless these groups. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. See you soon.